Today I want to talk to you about how Des changed his thinking on the traditional Seventh-day Adventist interpretation of prophecy. In 1980, the Southern Pacific Division defrocked Australian Desmond Ford from the Seventh-day Adventist ministry after more than 30 years of service as a pastor, teacher and scholar. At the time, Ford was teaching in the Religion Department of Pacific Union College in California. Nine months earlier, Ford had spoken out about problems he perceived with the Adventist doctrine of the investigative judgment. The forum where he spoke was hosted by the Adventist Association of Adventist professionals and took place on the Pacific Union College campus. Within days, Ford was summoned to General Conference headquarters where he was given six months to write up his views. In April 1980, participants at the General Conference session in Dallas, Texas, voted a statement of 27 fundamentals, including the 23rd, which was about the investigative judgment, a doctrine held exclusively by Seventh-day Adventists. In August 1980, 111 administrators and scholars from the World Church met to discuss Ford's case at Glacier View, Colorado, by the last day, it was clear that Ford would be dismissed. Why was it that Ford, a devout Christian, had ended up in this position? How had his thinking changed? What were the factors that caused him to speak out? This paper will look briefly at the milieu from which Adventism evolved and discuss the widespread anti-Catholicism of the day. Adventist eschatology is intertwined with anti-Catholic sentiments, a fact that has been of increasing embarrassment to Seventh-day Adventist church leaders since the rest of Protestantism has largely renounced these views. I will discuss the development of Ford's thinking about prophetic interpretation and factors and groups that brought the crisis to a head. Seventh-day Adventism received their Advent focus and prophetic calculations from William Miller, a former deist, converted in 1814 after his war experiences as a captain in the army. Miller used Usher's estimate of 457 BC in Ezra 7 as a starting date for the 70 weeks of Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel 24-27. And this ended up in 33 AD, the date of Christ's death, according to Usher. We're talking here about James Usher, who was an Irish Anglican primate back in the 1500s and 1600s, so it's a long time back. Miller used the year day principle purportedly found in Ezekiel 4 6 and Numbers 14.34, to convert the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14 into 2300 years, ending up in 1843. Sandit Sandin notes that Miller developed a system of prophetic interpretation that came remarkably close to duplicating that developed by the historicist premillennialists of Britain. Sandine suggests that Miller's emphasis on the date of Christ's return is often erroneously said to mark him off from the rest of the church, particularly the millenarian parties. In fact, the expectation that the year 1844 would bring the next great cataclysm was quite common among historicists pre manuals pre I'll have trouble with this every time, pre-millenarians in both Britain and the United States. Bull and Lockhart expressed this well. The Millerites were probably normal in all respects save their Millerism, but because of their Millerism, they were deemed abnormal in every other respect as well. And they 
Bull and Lockhart summarise the development of Adventism as follows. Seventh-day Adventism emerged in the years after the Great Disappointment. Its earlier leaders, leaders, Joseph Bates, James White and Ellen Harmon, were all former Millerites. For the first seven years, adherents to the movement were drawn almost exclusively from those who had waited in vain on October the 22nd, 1844. Adventism thus originated not from within wider society, but from a, di a disintegrating tradition that was considered thoroughly antisocial in its beliefs and practices. The Adventists did not attempt to shake off the legacy of Millerism by reinterpreting the significance of October the 22nd, 1844. They enshrined the date and Miller's movement as an important episode in salvation history. It was on that date Adventists came to believe that the judgment of saints and sinners began in heaven. Ford, Desmond Ford, says Miller's main contribution did not have to do with dates, but with the event. In the mid and late 19th century, scholars believed that Christ could not come for over a thousand years. First, there would be peace and prosperity for a millennium. Seminaries had been influenced by the philosophers who, following Rousseau and other Enlightenment thinkers, taught that human nature was essentially good, therefore the world would get better and better. This trend began with the discoveries of Columbus and Copernicus and was fostered by optimistic philosophers and burgeoning science. Evolution spurred it all on after 1860. By contrast, Miller and his followers taught that the world was to get worse and that there would be no great millennium of peace before Christ returned. So they restored the New Testament picture of eschatology, an increase in evil, and then the advent. Anti-Catholicism was rampant in those days among all Protestant churches. Alstrom comments that it stemmed from the days when Queen Elizabeth led the Protestant cause against Philip of Spain and all the allies of popery. The Puritans carried it to the American colonies and it was kept alive by the imperial threat of France and Spain. Anti-Catholicism nourished the idea that the United States had a special responsibility to realise its destiny as a Protestant nation and it offered a motive for Protestant solidarity and reunion. Alstrom details the population changes from 1790, when over half were from British countries, mainly three ecclesiastical blocks, Congregationalists, Anglicans and Presbyterians. Alstrom notes, Roman Catholics and Jews constituted at most 0.1 zero, 0 of the population. The Great Atlantic Migration between 1832 and 1932, especially after 1890, altered this ratio drastically. By 1850, Roman Catholics, once a tiny and ignored minority, had become the country's largest communion. Adventism breathed in this bigotry like all contemporary Protestant denominations of the time. But while these anti-Catholic attitudes have remained among traditional Adventists, largely kept alive by their historicist beliefs and prophecy, other Protestant churches have changed. Rainer Bruinsma, Secretary of the Trans-European Division of Adventists, suggests that official Adventist prophetic interpretations have not made any dramatic changes in recent history. He continues, as a result, Adventist understanding of the historicist role, the historical role of Roman Catholicism and of the end time drama with Catholicism as one of the key players has remained basically unaltered. The traditional arguments for the anti-Christian nature 
of Roman Catholicism continue to be heard, even though they are often more carefully worded at present than in the past. More and more, however, it is recognised that the Seventh-day Adventist Church faces a problem. What does it do with their end-time prophecies that are rooted in a 19th century interpretation of the world? Bruinsma states that the Adventist Church now finds itself in a dilemma because Catholicism has changed, but Adventism has not. Ellen White's strong support of this apocalyptic scenario and its anti-Catholic focus creates problems for the Church's image among other churches. Many, possibly even most Adventists, still look at late 20th century Catholicism through 19th century eyes. Many are unable or unwilling to see the many different faces of Catholicism in different parts of the world, or to recognise the tremendous changes and developments that have taken place within Catholicism. I hope this study will help some of my fellow Adventist, Adventists to realise how the traditional Adventist position developed in a particular historical context and to understand the need for a fresh approach that will re-evaluate the traditional Adventist views in the context of our times. Neil Wilson, at the time the North American Division President and later General Conference President, made a remarkable statement under oath in the Mary Kay Silver case prior to Ford's Glacier View trial. The equal Employment Opportunities Commission, the EEOC, had taken the church to court on its behalf over the church's failure to give equal pay for women. I should have said they took the church to court on Mary Kay Silver's behalf over the church's failure to give equal pay for women and the Church defended its action by claiming to be a hierarchy like the Roman Catholic Church. In a sworn affidavit, Wilson denied anti-Catholicism as a modern tenet of the Estic DA Church as follows. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint and the term hierarchy was used in a pejorative sense to refer to the papal form of the church governance, that attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the latter part of the last, which is now being consigned to the historical trash heap as far as the Seventh-day Adventist church is concerned. Now, I should say, I wrote this paper when I was studying history at the University of New England at Armadale. And I haven't kept the date, I'm sorry to say, that I did this, but I think it was 2009. And subsequent to that, I heard from Bert Holoviak, who was the then... General Conference archivist in Washington, D.C., and he told me that that statement was fictitious but didn't give me any other information. So, to be fair, I'm adding that. While these men <coughs> faced an administrative problem, Desmond Ford was struggling with the theological problems implicit in the SDA historicist views of prophecy. Ford was born in 1929 in Townsville, Queensland, Australia. His father was a Morse code operator in the Prime Minister's office during the war. His parents were interested in health and had their first Seventh-day Adventist contact in 1929, while his mother Lillian was carrying Ford. The Ford showed the salesman the door when he presented the Seventh-day Sabbath. Ford's parents parted ways when Desmond was age nine and his brother Val was 12, a lady coal porter, Ruth Bird, 
visited the home about the time of Ford fa Ford's father left and later brought her minister husband to study with Lillian and he gave Ford his first Bible study at age nine. Ford left school at age 15 and went to work at Associated Newspapers as a trainee journalist. At age 16, he was baptised into the Adventist Church. He went to Avondale College in Kurumbong from 1947 to 1950. After graduation from the ministerial course, Ford colported, sold books door to door for nine months after working for three months in the George Burnside Mission in Newcastle, New South Wales. Then followed six years of pastoring and evangelism in Coffs Harbour, Corindai, Gunnedah and Inverell in New, New South Wales. He married Gwen Booth, a primary teacher, in 1952. In 1955, when Gwen was pregnant with their first child, Ellen, now Ellen, Des was invited to debate Pastor Bergen, a Church of Christ minister who liked to grill Adventist ministers over the Sabbath. Pastor David Sibley was the Trans-Tasman president, and as a result of the debate, Sibley recommended Des go back to Avondale College to finish his bachelor's degree in theology. From there, the Southern South Pacific Division sent Ford and his family to Potomac University in Washington, Washington DC. I realised I said the Southern Pacific and it's South Pacific. Where Ford began a Bachelor of Divinity. One of his teachers, Dr. Edward Heppenstall, paved the way for Ford to finish his Masters in Ancient History in six months in, instead of doing the BD. Ford then completed a PhD in rhetoric at Michigan State University in 18 months and his thesis was on the Pauline Gospels, the rhetoric of St. Paul. After finishing his studies in USA, Des and Gwen moved back to Avondale College where he began teaching in 1961 as the head of the religion department. In 1964, at the age of 33, his wife, Gwen, was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a radical mastectomy. She later had another son in 1966. The cancer returned within six months of his birth and Gwen gradually faded away over the next years, dying in April 1970. Ford remarried in November 1970 and was sent by the SPD to do a second PhD at the University of Manchester in England under the tutelage of Professor F.F. F. Bruce. This was a research degree in New Testament theology called the Abomination of Desolation in Biblical Eschatology. Ford completed this thesis in 18 months and Des and Jill returned to Avondale at the end of 1972 and Ford taught there as the head of the department from the beginning of 1973 until 1977 when they went to California.